Welcome to the Whiskey and Wisdom Podcast. This is episode number three. I'm Tyler Yaw, and this is my co-host, Chris Kellum, and our special guest for the day, Brittany Limeberry. She is a real estate agent and branding photographer. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for showing up. I'm here for you. On time, too. And she showed up on time. Early. Early. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's a new one for me. (laughs) I think she heard we had whiskey and was like, oh, yeah, we showed up on time. Coming for that. (laughs) With that being said, what are we sipping on today, Chris? All right. So, our first sip today is going to be something I have literally never seen before. It looks like it's called Barrel House Select Bourbon. So, it's a Kentucky bourbon whiskey, but it has an old school. Distill method from corn, rye, basic like malted barley. And they actually do it in like a number four char barrel. So each barrel, how they char the inside affects the flavor. So you can go from one all the way up, which is kind of nice because it's from Kentucky. They actually have, um, Appalachian mountain spring water. Oh, I love it. Nice. How do you say Appalachian? Appalachian. Appalachian. You don't say Appalachian. He's not even from here. <laughs> uh, I love that. I was just curious. I didn't sure. know. But no, I mean, I think we should all just cheers. Cheers to, to that. Cheers. To a fun one. It's got for sure that like classic foundational whiskey. Like if somebody was new to whiskey and needed to know like what to expect from just a super foundational whiskey, that would be it. Yeah. That's a very good point. Should be like the first sip for everyone who hasn't had whiskey before. I would go with that. Yeah. Just make sure you put it on on rock. Yeah. A yeah. rock rocks. Mm-hmm. Whichever you prefer. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, we'll get into it now. Um, again, this is Brittany Lineberry. Just an introduction to how we all know each other. Back, we found out it was three years ago already. We all worked inside a jewelry store, Reach Jewelers, here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we just became best friends out of really nowhere and different experiences together and joined our coalition and went off on our own in different ways as we started to grow our own businesses and kind of get where we are. And Chris is holding down the fort there and keeping the legacy rolling over at Reed's. Yeah. I feel like we just need some young blood still there. And as soon as we hire somebody who's in their twenties, I can be like, all right, let's leave. (laughs) After we left was when you <laughs> caught your stride too. I mean, you have caught some serious momentum going on up there. I mean, I would love to say it's because you guys got out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> that may be true. I love that. Yeah. I think, like, y- y- y'all just need to leave. It's one of those, I think it was more I had to rise to the occasion. So I love it. Yeah, but. you're crushing it. I love to see it. Let's learn more about you. So <laughs> tell us about yourself. Okay. So... You caught the rough shell of it, and you asked me earlier today a question of, is this two jobs, or is Mm -hmm. this one job, sort of? And I've been asked that a lot lately, but I feel like this is one big job, because I cater to real estate agents on the photography side of things, helping people really kind of like niche down into into their, their, their ultimate focus for their clientele. So on the photography side, I focus on branding and helping people do that. But my personal niche is in new construction. So a little behind the scenes here, as far as real estate goes, my husband works for a custom home building company. And way back when we were in the jewelry store, I remember just thinking that I had been doing that for 10 years and felt like it was time to kind of, I don't want to say level up, but just level into something different, something that I was really challenging myself. I was ready for something new. And I looked to him to kind of... I don't know, give me some advice or guidance on the industry. And, mm-hmm. and that was a way for me to branch out and, and try something you know new and different. So I got my real estate license in 2019 and joined a real estate team right out of the gate. Somebody that I actually had met in the jewelry store and had bonded with and has have really just grown from there. But on the photography side of things, Way back in college, I went to North Carolina state Mm -hmm. and studied. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that was just like the perfect experience for a university because they just value, they value hard work, but they value kind of like being a homegrown kind of human being. And, 
they value authenticity, they value diversity. And so I just got a very well-rounded experience there. And when I was at NC State, I was studying psychology primarily, but I was able to take design courses Mm -hmm. as part of my electives. And I was probably a handful of classes short from having a minor in art and design. So when you say design courses, are you talking about like house design or like cultural design? Like I don't know anything about design. They have all of that there, but the courses that I took were more of the foundational, just the fundamentals of design courses. So really just kind of understanding how to make things visually balanced, how to speak to your, your clientele or your audience, how to convey your message, but understanding line and direction and just how to visually put things together. Okay. And with, with that, I picked up a camera. I don't know if this is allowed, but I used part of a student loan to buy my very first camera. I don't know if my dad knows that because I'm pretty sure that loan was partially in his name. So (laughs) sorry, (laughs) but I, um, she'll pay you back now. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. 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 He won't ask for it, but you know, that's the father daughter relationship, I think. So I picked up a camera and I would say that that camera probably paid for my school books in college. It was just something I did off to the side and got paid here and there for it. Graduated college and kind of laid down the camera and started in retail sales, which I loved for a long time. So when you say retail, Mm -hmm. where did you start? Because I started in retail and my retail was way (laughs) different. Yeah. I'm assuming because I've been here in town. It goes too far back. I remember when I was 15 and a half, I think was when you could get your like permit to work. Yeah. And I was hired at a pageant dress store. (laughs) (laughs) Knowing you now, I can't see you in a pageant dress at all. So they had pageant dresses and prom dresses. This is the little bitty boutique in Wake Forest, North Carolina, which is where I grew up. And it was kind of like a little dream working there because you're a 16 year old girl and you care about nothing else other than like fashion and doing something that's kind of cool and feels kind of glamorous. And then went into college and got a summer job one year at Pier One. I could see you doing Pier One. Oh, that Mm -hmm. was fun. That was super fun. I think somewhere around that same time, I'm losing my timeline a little bit, but that same summer, I might have also pulled some hours at a um, clothing store Mm -hmm. and then got recruited from both of those into my first jewelry store, which was Hellsberg. So you and I have that in common. Exactly. Exactly. And I worked for them throughout the rest of college. So I've always had like a sales, retail, customer service oriented mindset. And I've been in a lot of a variety of environments that kind of cater to, you know, and I guess an ideal kind of client. Right. Which makes sense. Definitely. Do you think being in a customer service business, do you think that is what caused you to want to level up? Because you would hit that kind of peak in the jewelry industry. You're like, okay, well... If I want to stay in this area, there's not really much more you can do besides custom jewelry. Yeah. Um, and you, I mean, you could want to sell cars, but I don't No. <laughs> so we're, we're assuming Drew is the reason you're like, I don't want to do cars. I'll do houses. Exactly. Yeah. He well, So we do have a vision of kind of building something together within that category. But I think it's, my sales history has always trended in that dirt, like trended from when I was 16 selling the dresses. I, would, I didn't even get commission on them. It was mm-hmm. just, an, I was paid hourly. Like what was minimum wage back then when you were 16? And that's just, (laughs) you know, I didn't even know to even try to negotiate that. I was like, yeah, you're willing to pay me something. Sure. Like just pay for my gas to get here. Like get me out on the town. (laughs) I mean, it could still be the same minimum wage. I don't know. I think I feel like it was like eight bucks. What is it now? (laughs) Is it? Yeah, it's still around. Well, there we are. So, and then, you know, you get into jobs that do pay you commission. You get into jewelry that does pay you commission. So you're where you're rewarded for your productivity. Mm Mm-hmm. And that concept is, is rewarding, but it, I mean, it's also very frustrating Yep. and we all know that, but so yeah, the slowly trending upwards towards like selling, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it's about the money, but you do selling more expensive things comes along with different challenges. Definitely. It comes along with a different clientele. It comes along with having to educate yourself more about the product that you're selling. You're not just selling something pretty. You're not selling something that's just essential, like when I was 16, people had to have a prom dress or they had to have Mm -hmm. whatever occasional piece they needed. So it comes to like where, when you're selling jewelry, 
you know, like sometimes it's essential, like an engagement ring or a wedding band. And then sometimes it's not, and you have to like really know the product to get people to see the value in it. Mm -hmm. And so now that I'm in houses, (laughs) you know, like it's a, there's a risk involved. Like that was something that I felt like was going to make me feel fulfilled. Like I was doing something that was super important for people. You're giggling. Tell me why you're giggling. (laughs) I was just giggling because that drink was killing me. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better slow down over here. Yeah, this like slow level up to things that are now high risk. That actually kind of leads me to the the main question that I wanted to ask you today, too. I know we had many conversations over the years about leaving the jewelry industry. Mm-hmm. So what was the actual catalyst of leaving jewelry and being willing to take that dive into something that you knew about because of your husband, but something you haven't done previously in the past and completely changing careers. Yeah. Um, sheer frustration Mm -hmm. (laughs) in a lot of different ways, but the bulk of the frustration came from me envisioning a way that I wanted to cater to my clientele and not being able to cater to them in the way that I really wanted to, because when you, when you falling under the umbrella of a brand that has already established itself, and then you want to speak to your clientele in a way that may not match that brand and you, you can't, right. You just can't, you can't communicate with them that way. Or, or if I wanted to gift them something, or if I wanted to market to them in a certain way, I realized I was going to have to go out on my own if I wanted to, for people to see like who I am and what I'm about and how I want to take care of them. It was too convenient that my husband is in housing, right? but also with my experience in kind of those design courses and then just the way that I have accelerated my growth in sales over the past what, 16, 17 years now, yeah. it fell into place that housing made sense for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then how did ph- photography play a role in doing that too? Because I know in past conversations, photography was always kind of like the baby on the side. How did that get brought into real estate? I can't, oh, this is just a very specific to Brittany kind of thing. Like mm-hmm. I can in, in sales, I get bored maybe. Right. Okay. So there's this, I think it's that millennial. It could be, I mean, where my attention is called in a lot of different directions, but there's this, there's this itch like Mm -hmm. you were talking about in your, your previous episode here. So there was just this itch for creativity that I was not able to get to. And with photography, there's a couple of things about photography that I love. One is that you get immediate gratification. So when I have a vision for something creative and I want to see it come to life, I can snap a photo and with a few minutes, I can edit that photo and have my vision come to life. And I get the immediate gratification of, of my creativity. And I enjoy painting and drawing and doing other things like that, but I just don't get that like instant creative relief. And photography was something that I have a natural knack for. I love the technicalities of it. And I like to kind of, I guess, challenge myself in, in learning how the technology of that is improving and you just can, it's easy to grow with. Right. So I've been doing that since I was in college. And, and so that was easy for me to pick back up on when I needed that creative diversion from being in sales, which is routinely a very structured kind of industry to be in. Yeah. Good point. I guess that is kind of a good kind of creative release to kind of break out of the monotonous day to day. Yes. Yeah. Cause you were doing like family photos or like couple out couple photo sets. Yeah. And I was, cause I know you've done some branding for people more recently. How did you transition? how did you go from taking photos of like friends and families or like engagement shoots to wanting to be like, you know, I want to help people with their branding message. It's that's the most loaded question <laughs> that you can ask me when I, you're right that I was photographing anything and everything when I first got started. I mean, they were good photos. Oh, I was having fun with it. And I, I would, I just wanted to explore the industry and like really see what spoke to me and what I was having fun with. And I discovered very quickly that there were certain things that I did not love enjoying or <laughs> love photographing. So for one thing that I don't love, but I'm starting to get used to mm-hmm. is, you know, it, he already knows <laughs> baby. Did I tell you that? No, I okay. just guessed <laughs> babies. Yeah. I just, because I'm not a mom. So that just, that communicate, that communication style doesn't speak to me or I have a hard time, like 
figuring out how to interact with, with moms maybe. Right. And I don't know, that'll probably come as time goes on or as Drew and I make that decision. But I love, I, and I, this is how I advertise my photography business now, fiercely loving couples. So I really love the emotion and the dynamic between people, like a couple or two okay. people. And then primarily now it's come, like you just said, into branding. And for that, I think as I learned more about myself and how I wanted to like hone in on the things that I love in life, I want to help other people visualize their brand and their business. And then I guess focus on how to help them deliver that message to the world. And there's some really heart, heartfelt stuff that we can get into if you want to. You've got the time for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, so how the two tie together real estate and photography for me. And a lot of people did not get this until I really recently started talking about how the two tie together. When I got into real estate, the, the way that they train you to sell or to get your clientele or to Mm -hmm. grow your business is to cold call. They'll give you a list Mm -hmm. of things that are available to you, like expired listings or people who they think might be interested in buying or selling a house. And they'll just give you this list and you can just start calling. And that even just saying it right now sounds absolutely miserable to me. I mean, if you're doing that, that means other people are doing the same thing. Yeah. I'm probably hitting the same customers too. So we'll get into that too. Oh, cause <laughs> I, after I verbalized that I was having trouble with this concept, especially coming from the industries that I came from where relationships were everything, right. I would get messages from people who were like, wow, you really see the industry very differently. Mm-hmm. And that fueled this fire. So Back to what I was saying though, I would, that was just how they tell you to build your business and they focus on the hustle and the working or answering your phone at nine o'clock at night. If you have to, because that's how you have to get the next deal. That's Mm -hmm. how you get your next paycheck. And of course being commission oriented, the more you answer the phone, the more at bats you have to get the next lead, to hopefully convert into the next client, to hopefully confirm into or or convert into a closing. And that's how you get your paycheck. But that's just not for me. Mm -hmm. And I knew it from day one when I was like this, like, this is not the, the industry that my husband has described to me. This Mm -hmm. is not what, um, the girl who recruited me into real estate described to me. This is just not what I thought I was getting into. Right. Exactly. And I'm like, I'm not sitting in this cubicle for eight hours a day calling how many, a hundred people to get one like the statistics, you know, 40 to, you have to make 40 to 70 Mm -hmm. phone calls to get one lead. And that's just a lead. It's not even an actual client. That's not an active client. Do you, then you have to go through the whole process, getting them Mm pre-qualified for a loan and making sure that the the actual finances of the whole thing work. And it just sounded like mind numbing to me, but also exhausting and not, not thrilling, just Mm -hmm. not what I had come to know. And I didn't feel like that was the way that it had to be for me. And so I started to fight the system a little bit and I tried exploring different avenues of marketing, getting out there, which you partially inspired me on this, Tyler, because you're a very networking kind Mm -hmm. of get out there and go to the events and talk to people and get to know people. And so I started to do that. I start, I gathered up a couple of girls that are in the Wilmington area and started a networking group. They were really kind of the catalyst that got me thinking about like work smarter, not harder, figure out like what really lights you up for sure. Who are the people that you want to work with? Who are the people that you can see pouring your heart into to make their kind of dreams come to uh, fruition? I've been able to meet quite a few of those, um, those women that you got together and stuff. And one of the things that I love about them is it's all about passion. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that, that speaks a lot because there's a lot of people out there right now that just have a job to have a job to pay that paycheck. But seeing people actually pursue their passions is uh, a lot more fun and inspiring for even someone like myself to watch. I'm friends with a lot of them on Instagram. Just watching their journeys is just exciting because you can tell when someone actually enjoys what they're doing every day. Yeah. I mean, it makes the job itself more enjoyable, but also from a client perspective, when 
you've met your perfect match. So let's just use my niche, which is new construction. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're going through it. Your experience with me is going to be completely different because you know that that's the thing that I just, that lights me up literally. Mm -hmm. And so you probably would look for whoever is interested in building a home or buying something that is new construction would know that they're working with somebody who's going to take absolutely the best possible care of them that they can. Because I have dedicated the past two years to educating myself about that. And then I got my hubby in my back pocket that if I need to ask a question, I can get a real quick, very reliable answer for you. So you're getting the best service possible. Whereas if I try to be a catch all, and this is what I see in the industry is, you know, especially from the photography side, when I'm asking realtors about their brand and who their niche is or what is what well, I ask them to describe their business in one sentence. That's mm-hmm. the very first question of an entire series of questions that I ask them. And they say, I want my clients to know that they're working with somebody who feels like their family. <laughs> okay. And then they're like, and I want to help everyone. I want to, I want to help as many people as I can help this year. And like, that's all well and good. But to me, you can't be a catch all and give everybody wonderful service. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I th- you see it everywhere. And it's like Walmart sells everything. Yeah. But it's not the best at anything. Right. And that's what I think I love what I've, I'm seeing from what you have coming up in your new, like the branding setup and what you're going for is helping people realize it's 2022. I need you to figure out what you really want to do and let's go with it. Yeah. Cause everyone keeps trying to like, grasp at straws and catch everything because they want to try and make money. But I don't think they realize that if you hone in on something and become great, you can be amazing. Sure. And, and people will see that and they understand that when you have a passion about one specific area. And when I'm, I I don't want to be misleading because I have a passion about two things. So that's not what I'm trying to say. Like I love the our arts. Sure. I love arts and I also love new construction. Right. So yeah. that can be confusing for people. I'm sure. But the thing here is I'm not a catch all. Like I have a very clear direction of who I'm trying to help and what I'm trying to do for people. And they, I'm hoping that they understand that and they'll come to me as my ideal client. But I, there was something else I was going to say there. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, I'm like, I literally, I have, Oh, also you, the people who are not clear about their, who they really want to take care of are also not clear about, I think their financial goals or what is really important in their personal life too. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's just entirely a shot in the dark. If you don't have the, if you don't have the self-awareness to know really what you want out of this broad picture of life. Right. And so, and I was just talking to a buddy of mine the other day when I was like, what's the difference in your quality of life between a hundred grand a year and 110 grand a year, those extra couple of transactions or those extra couple of clients that you might've helped. Did Mm -hmm. that, did that bring you anything that was super beneficial to your quality of life? Did that award you, did that extra 10,000 really make a difference at the end of the year in what you experienced throughout the year? And I'm like, so for me, the, there's a balance between finding the sweet spot on like what numbers make sense for right. me and helping the people that I feel like I can really like give my heart and soul to, and then having the time at home to dedicate to my husband and whatever personal goals that we have going on too. Yeah. I think that's super important too, that work-life balance, especially, um, having a kid now really kind of spoke to me too. And that's kind of the practice that we have on the finance side as well is for us, it's more important to connect with that client than to just have that transaction. And as you guys know, Wilmington is definitely a place where there's a bunch of realtors out there already. And I think really honing in on your niche. Almost 4,000. Jeez. Seriously. In the Cape Fear. That's I, crazy. I might, and my numbers might even be a couple of years old. Yeah, so it's probably even more. <laughs> but, so, I mean, like, what you're shooting for with your, what you're releasing coming mm-hmm. up or what you just released. Yeah, by the time this um, episode comes out, you're going to have released your 
mm-hmm. new branding. So mm-hmm. t- tell us about that. Give us kind of the lowdown, like what you want people to know about it and mm-hmm. how you can help them out. Yep. So this caters to people in the real estate industry, and that could be a real estate agent or a lender. Okay. I've come to find out that lenders would also be interested in this. And the phrasing of the program is really geared towards real estate agents, but I think it translates very easily over to people that are in the mortgage industry. I could see that. So the first thing that I would want people to know is this is for somebody who wants to not hustle to the point of exhaustion, right? Like, mm-hmm. I see plenty of my colleagues that want to hustle all day long and I admire them for wanting to run their business that way. And if that is for you, chase the dream, get all the transactions, get the income, help as many people as you possibly can, like go for it. And I, I want those people to be happy and live their life. Sure. But I totally realize that there's other people like me who are trying to find the balance and want to really like pour their heart into a certain type of client. Mm -hmm. And maybe, the, the painstaking thing here is that the pressure from the industry is that if you are not working all day, every day, even on Sundays, if you're not making those cold calls, if you're not just grinding, grinding, then maybe you're not as hungry or not as passionate or not as much of a go-getter mm-hmm. as other people are in the industry. Or maybe that makes you not as good at your job since you weren't able to help 50 clients last year by right. homes. That's just like, <clears throat> to me, that's just not true. Mm-hmm. You can be a very talented, educated, witty, qu- quick to problem solve all of those things and help 20 clients a year that are maybe your ideal client. And that's good money right. like in the, in this industry. That's great money, especially if you're helping like your ideal client, whoever, you know, I mean, whoever that might be, that's just going to be, that's going to be a feel good kind of, kind of business. And so when I was talking about these things on Instagram or on Facebook about the way that I was processing this industry, Mm -hmm. I was getting a lot of messages from people who were like, I wish that I could do that. Or I hope that I can niche or I am trying to figure out how to do that and still be respected within this industry. Sure. And so I was like, I can, I know I can help these people because I wholeheartedly feel this way about my job. And so for me, that means offering them my creative services to help them visualize their brand. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when they say they want to cater to a certain type of clientele, we're going to gather up the materials. We're going to figure out how you need to verbalize this. We're going to take beautiful pictures to help you deliver the message, both visually and in, in the written words, I'm right. going to help you formulate how you want to convey the message. And then we're going to package it up into a subscription. I don't like the word subscription, but that's the way to convey the message. <laughs> sure, right. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, easiest way to understand. yeah, it's, it's four photo shoots in one year. Okay. The very first photo shoot is going to be a, fa- what I call the branding foundational. It just helped the, f- the first session is going to help you figure out your niche, figure out the ideal client, figure out how to convey the message. And then we're going to take just some great photography that will last you through the whole year if you need it to. The second, third, and fourth session, I call the subsequent sessions. They're going to be more geared towards your events that you might be hosting, client gifts, or what we call your sphere of influence is is your direct core people that are going to refer you business and really take care of you. How can you cater to them? Any marketing things that you need, like all of that, we're going to help. We're going to really formulate that. And we're going to help your, your photography convey that message of what's coming up for the season. So it might be summer themed fall, holiday, Christmas, whatever you celebrate. And so we're going to use the whole year to cater to your clientele and build your brand. That's great. So it's kind of from the very beginning of figuring out what your business is all the way through the marketing to the end dream client of yours. You got it. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Cause I, I personally, I, I have a lot of people in the real estate industry that I I'm in contact with a lot. It doesn't sound like there's really anyone out there that's doing this right Mm-mm, now. No. And what you see of the people that you see online, mm-hmm. what is the thing? And you may or may not pay attention to this, but if you're looking for a real estate agent 
What is the thing that they post all day, every day? Closing a house. Just listed, just mm-hmm, sold, yep. under contract, on repeat, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can go to some of their pages and it is like a picture of a house, a picture of a house, a picture of a house, a picture of a house. Exactly. A picture. You're not like, I'm like, who are you? Who, what am I going to like, what is it like to work with you? Mm-hmm. Who do you love to work with? Like, I don't know anything about your personality. I don't know anything about like, it's just pictures of houses. And to me, you are not going to get the client that just lights you up that you're going to connect with. That's going to rave about you. And I say, okay, if you don't get your right client, shitty clients refer shitty clients. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to breathe that into your business. So I'm like, I want my Instagram page to speak to the people who like, I want to work with. Like, I want these people to love me and I want to love them back and I want them to send their friends to me. So I get more people (laughs) just like that. You know, it's kind of a very similar story from the last week's guest where I literally just saw him on Instagram for weeks, just posting about him listening to funky music while he was pressure washing homes and stuff with one of his buddies and all of the fun that they were having and feeding his chickens and just really learning about him. And I was like, you know what? This guy's awesome. He deserves my money. He's getting my business. So just you being able to break into that and helping other people do that in the real estate industry, I think they're going to see their money come back to him in like multiples. I hope so. I mean, if that's what they want, right? Right, exactly. Like I know what you said. If you're if you're in that transactional phase and you just want to bust out fifty sure. transactions a week, then so be it. If you want to hustle that way, then great. If you want to take that time and to really enjoy kind of what you're doing, then um, taking the time to sit down and make that plan with you, I think, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think it's so easy to get caught up in seeing what other when you have almost four thousand people that are doing the same thing as you, right. and that's what they're posting. And maybe they make great money, or they're successful, mm-hmm. or they're considered a, a quotes like top producer, <laughs> right. top producer. So if that, <laughs> if that, right? It's so competitive. You're which absolutely kills, right. I mean, which kills me, but. Yeah. Okay. So if you see that, then you feel like that's what you should be doing. And I hate that word should like, Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what so-and-so that sold $20 million last year should be doing. So, or that, you know, maybe that's what I should be doing if I want to get to where they are. And the peer pressure is so real Mm -hmm. and it's just, I call it garbage because it's putting the impression on the, you that you have to conduct business a certain way. And it's, literally just not. I'm glad you brought that up too, because that actually leads into a question that I was, I was going to ask later, but it fits in now. I think you're actually the one who introduced me to Simon Sinek. And oh yeah. Yeah. So you talk about the passion and everything and what you plan on doing, but what is your why? Mm. This is why I didn't want to give you the questions ahead of time. <laughs> I, I feel like I have a lot of whys, but if I really like dig down into it, I don't know if I'm, I may not be as proud to say this out loud, but I was, I signed up for a business coaching session with a very well-known photographer here Mm -hmm. in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. Her work is beautiful. Her name's Chelsea Allegra. Shout out to her (laughs) because she was part of my networking group a couple of years ago. And since then we've kept in touch And she was offering business coaching and sat down with her and she kind of asked me the same question. What is my why? And she told me to not be, don't be too reserved about what my answer was to her question. And then she kind of completed my sentence because I couldn't find the right word for it. Recognition is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And so for me in this, in this moment, in this season that I'm in, I really want to like model what I'm preaching. And I want people to see that what I'm passionate about when it comes to like quality time with my family, making sure that I'm dedicating time to my home life. I'm finding the perfect balance is being conveyed to people. So, so my why is not, it's not for the money. It's not for, it's not for my clients to dote on me and love. It's not, it's not for that. It's more for Mm -hmm. like me proving a point that you can be happy, successful in whatever way you feel you want to be successful and still have that time to dedicate to the very private parts of your life. Also like proving that you can fight the system and do things a different way because I've always fought the system. Mm -hmm. Like I've never been somebody that if you tell me I have to do things 
a certain way or like fit a certain mold, I'm just not, I'm just not going to be very (laughs) accepting of that. I don't, I don't love like authority being like, because I said so, Mm -hmm. I hate hate that phrase. And so if you say, because I said so, or that's just, that's just the way it's done, or that's the way it's been done for years. And that's the way we're going to do it. I am going to fight back and I'm going to be like, I'm going to prove you wrong. (laughs) I'm going to go do it this way. And I'm going to show you that it can work and that I'm going to be happy doing it. And I'm going to like prance around while I'm doing it. So (laughs) yeah, you've seen that before. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> and maybe, maybe recognition is not the right word, but for me, it's like being acknowledged. It's, I want people to acknowledge that you can go your own way and still find happiness. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's a fantastic why it kind of that by itself might have been the best way to, even though you didn't mean to do it this way to market what you're doing mm-hmm. and trying to help people. Because I think a lot of people feel that way and they just don't know how to one, put it in words which you were forced to do through Chelsea to kind of help you with it. And for someone to have those words and have someone that does what you do kind of have that guidance. I, that probably means a lot to a lot of people, even ones that you can't reach for whatever reason. But if they hear this, I think that'll um, definitely give some, some motivation. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. (laughs) Great answer. (laughs) So probably my last question I have for you before I let you kind of go and sign off and everything too, is looking back now, if you could tell your younger version of yourself anything, what would it be? Fight harder. Yeah, that's the answer. So elaborate on that. Yeah. When I was, um, I I think this has molded like me into who I am today. So when I was a teenager, when I was younger, I knew you were going to ask me this. I knew it. I knew it. I was was thinking in the car on the way here, they're going to ask me this one question that's going to make me tell this story. And I come from a childhood that kept me on a very, I want to say short leash. Mm -hmm. Okay. Straight and narrow. This is the way it's done. This is what society expects of you. Mm Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling, um, you know, like I was excelling in that pathway and, and like I was getting, I was reaping the benefits of do of going that route. Sure. My parents were proud of me and my teachers were so proud of me. And I was like an A plus student mm-hmm. and I, you know, whatever. And I had that and that's, and then you get into college and the thing that they tell you is going to happen to you happens to you. Mm-hmm. Where you just explode at the seams <laughs> and you want to like try all the things and do all yeah. that. And I didn't get in trouble. I was never one to get in trouble, but I for sure wanted to get out there and like see the world and try things. So what was the question again? Can you just work, say it, say it one more time for me just so I can hear it. I want to give you the right answer. Yeah. What would you tell your younger self now looking back on everything that oh, you've yeah, been fight through? Harder. Okay. So if I would not have been so accepting and would back to, like, I think I always had this little beast inside of me that wanted to bust out and try things, mm-hmm. get into college. And I, and I did that, but if I was younger and fought harder against the system, I think I would have had more opportunities opened up to me. I would have could sure. been probably more worldly, more educated. My husband jokes with me now, and mm-hmm. I do not take it personally that I I have found that I have a lot of book smarts and not a lot of street smarts <laughs> sometimes. Like I just don't know in some ways like how the world operates and it took me a long time. So getting into my later twenties, I think I finally have like started to accumulate those street smarts. And now that I'm in my thirties, I feel very well-rounded, but it definitely took me fighting the system Mm -hmm. after getting into college and going out on my own. So I would tell people when they're younger, don't, when somebody says this is the way it's done, don't just take that at surface or face value. Like consider that maybe that's not the truth. Consider who you're, who's giving you that advice. Ask other people for like, when I have a question about something, I ask like five different people. Right. And that's not me challenging what that first person told me. It's not that I don't trust you. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that I heard your version of it and I'm going to go ask four other people and I'm going to get their version of it. And whichever one agrees with me the most, is probably the one that I'm going to go with. And I wish I would have done that when I was younger. People take that personally, by the way, if you go ask other people 
if I'm like, I'm asking you advice for something and then I turn right around and I ask somebody else for this, for, you know, the same question, Mm -hmm. that first person takes it personally. It ain't nothing against you, man. Like I I just may not like vibe with what you said. Yeah. And it may, or it may have not been a deep enough explanation, or I didn't get the answer that I thought I was going to get. And I'm just want, I'm more curious. So fight harder to get the answers that you need to find the guidance that you need. Don't just accept what people are telling you. Nice. It's not the end all be all. I think that's a perfect way to wrap this up, but I know you are <laughs> on a time constraint as well. <laughs> Any <clears throat> last words that you were hoping to get out to the hopefully millions of people that are listening Mm. to (laughs) us. To all the millions of people, I'm accepting a very, very small single handful of people into that (laughs) subscription service because I think to keep my sanity and to be able to cater to my ideal clients, I'm only going to take a few of them on this first launch and I'll launch it again in the fall. But for the people who really think that this is a good fit for them, who are in the real estate industry in some capacity, hunt me down and let's talk about it because I want to find the right people for this. So yeah. Cause if you want them to hunt you down, yeah. We're where can they find stuff. you? Yeah. Well, I'm like drop you in the show yeah. notes. I have just consolidated all of my social media into one Instagram and that's the best way to find me. So it's Brittany G Lineberry on Instagram or on Facebook is fine. There is an account still floating around out there. That's Lineberry Photography Co. And mm-hmm. I'm not using that account anymore because I want everybody to realize that this is one big job for me, not two right. little jobs. And so messaging me on there, there's a link tree on there. You can go and find all the things. And there's a few free downloads on my website, which is lineberryphotographyco.com. One of the free downloads that I think everybody should just go get for fun is one called Spoil Your Sphere which really just gives you some creative advice on how to take care of your Mm. immediate clientele, the ones that are going to refer you business. So that's a good one just to kind of get oriented to how I function and how I like to talk to my people. So that's fantastic. And I'll try to make it as easy as possible too. I'll drop your um, Instagram and the show notes and any other way that you want them to get in contact with you too. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, everybody. It's Chris. Any? Yeah. I mean, I'm just excited to see, where you go and the growth. Cause I mean, as you know, it's been three years since we've all been together, but every one of us is like a tree. Our branches are kind of going in different directions, mm-hmm. but they're all mm-hmm. showing a lot of growth. I'm really excited to see what you got. You guys too. Definitely. So I wanted to make sure I told you that listening to your first episode, first off your temperaments, like your personalities are so chill. Like just sitting here in this room, just talking to you is easy, but As you go through, you said you wanted to talk to people about things that were not easy to talk about right? or that are difficult to talk about. And I love that. And like, I cannot wait to hear what these difficult conversations are because I am all about like a good, difficult down, like getting to the heart of the topic. And I want to see where y'all go with this. I'm excited. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. I guess we will start wrapping this up for the day then. Thank you everyone for listening. Again, that was Brittany Lineberry. Again, find her stuff in the show notes below. And please consider subscribing if you enjoyed. Download, share with your friends. That is the best way to support our podcast right now. Have a great day. See you you next week.